Let's see if we got some audio, new audio setup. I um, hope you guys are doing well today. Um, it's been a while since my last video, so I have some cool new, new kind of new to me at least, and then um, new things to talk about, and also it's just some updates for the community. Um, let me. Cool, we have audio. Um, <clears throat> so let's let's get started. Uh, without further ado, and if you haven't already subscribed, uh, hit that like button. Um, hit the subscribe button. I am gonna try to get back to my uh, regularly scheduled weekly updates here. Um, and uh, there are a bunch of burning things that came from the community over the past couple uh, weeks since uh, I was out and traveling. So we'll be covering those in the future live sessions. But uh, today we're talking about uh, Zephyr's uh, tool chain. So this is something that was new to me up until Nordic uh, Nordic's update, where they're, they changed over um, NRF Connect SDK to use a newer version of Zephyr. A newer, newer version of Zephyr references the Zephyr tool chain. And uh, before that was a thing, uh, typically, you'd be using the ARM GNU to ch tool chain, and then some of these environment variables should look fairly familiar for, for uh, folks who have used Zephyr and ARM devices in the past. It's essentially a drop-in replacement for the ARM tool chain, and it's all organized and tested, and uh, they have specific build releases and things like that. Um, related to Zephyr. And of course, if you really wanted to, you could use the Zephyr SDK for any other type of project if you wanted to. Uh, they just make it really easy to create uh, these you know, cross-compiling tool chains for the main three platforms. So you got Mac, uh, you got the um, for ARM and for Intel, and then for uh, Linux, ARM and Intel, and also Windows, and that's just for Intel only, obviously. Um, so we will s skip to the next thing here. And uh, so like I was saying, it, all it is for for all intents and purposes, the cool thing about this is that you can set, it's a, it's a script that they provide you. And as long as you have all the other dependencies, you need w, get, and cmake, and some other things, you can run that script. Or you can actually download that minimal SDK zip file and then download the actual SDK that you want to use. And that is actually what the latest version of the VS Code tools uh, plugin for VS Code um, or the Circuit Dojo Zephyr tools for VS Code. That's what it's actually doing is it downloading that SDK. And then uh, it's also downloading or downloading that minimal SDK. And I'll show you what that looks like. And then also downloading the ARM tool chain. Uh, but uh, you can check it out at that link below. I also have it in the description, and uh, you can check it out there. It's a handy resource, and it's good to understand what's going on. Um, and also, the cool thing about this toolchain is that uh, you can use it with older versions of Zephyr. So you can upgrade your toolchain, and then you can use it with you know, older versions of NCS and um, that's actually something that I've done here is I was just testing to build some of the samples for the NRF9160 Feather and they worked fine. There were some new compile warnings and errors and things like that. No errors, but there were some compile warnings. <clears throat> Maybe that's just how uh, they set up their SDK. So it's just something you need to uh, be aware of. It's something that's new, um, but it compiles and it runs, so I'm okay with it. Uh, you could see here, this, these are all the options that you have at your disposal. Um, as you, you know, Zephyr is, uh, the availability for targets is wide and vast. You could see these different platforms, Arc, ARM, MIPS, NIOS2, RISC V5, or, you know, RISC5, um, x86, and Xtenza, which is the, uh, I think, Espresso chips. But this is great because you get whatever target you have, you uh, th those are all the targets that I could ever think of. Um, some of these I've never even heard of, Arc and um, NIOS. So it just gives you some options and uh, you don't have to go digging around for a tool chain somewhere. It's already, for the most part, included, tested for you by the Zephyr community, which is really nice. 
Uh, if you go to, this is the latest, latest release as of today. It is 0.15.1. And uh, you can look down on that page and you'll see you have these SDK bundles. This is probably the more important thing is you need to set this up somewhere. You need to download either the minimal or the full. The full actually contains all the the, the uh, tool chains that just I listed here before in this previous slide. Basically, it bundles together everything. You got ARC, ARM, MIPS, all the tool chains, all of the compilers, essentially. Or you can use the minimal, which is literally just some CMake scripts or CMake files and some scripts. And uh, that's kind of the preferred way to do it because you don't really, if you're just using ARM, you don't really need everything else. And these downloads are like gigs. So, uh, and this is just explaining there's the minimal and the full. And I've been using the minimal for my internal purposes. And also, um, I've been using that for the, the VS Code plugin. So, it's just an option for you if you don't, if you care, download the whole thing or just use the minimal. Um, here's the, kind of the, the setup here. So I've actually downloaded the minimal and it's located in the um, separate tools toolchain folder. This is actually where it gets put. Uh, and you could see if I want to run this script that's just showing what's the contents of the folder and I'm just running the setup.sh. And as long as you have the dependencies, like I mentioned before, it should run okay. Um, I had a problem on Windows. It should work okay on Mac because most of the time it has all, you already have all the dependencies installed. Um, for scripting purposes, you also have the ability to, uh, by default, it's, it's interactive. So it'll actually uh, ask you for every single target if you want that tool chain or not. So you got to hit yes, enter, no, enter, no, enter. Or you can uh, provide it in like non-interactive mode and just provide a, tool, a, um, a target. So in this case, we're just using the ARM Zephyr EABI. And that's the one that would work for most you know, are all ARM chips, NR52, NR51, so on and so forth. So you can see here it's downloading and it's installing. All it's really doing is downloading a zip file and then extracting it to arm-zephyr.eabi within that uh, Zephyr SDK folder. Uh, and you also you can run um, just, just help or any other bogus command. It'll actually throw a help dialog that can help you with uh, different functionality of this the script. The script is well done, uh, and they make it pretty bulletproof, idiot-proof, which is nice. But you can see after uh, after it's done running, you, I'm just showing you this is where it ex expanded it to. And then when you're actually, as long as you provide the updated environment variables to Zephyr, uh, to this Zephyr SDK 0.15.1 folder, uh, the magic CMake files in here will make sure that it has access to the ARM toolchain and uh, everything will be hunky-dory, which is quite nice. And um, all we have to do here is the, we're still using the Zephyr underscore toolchain variant, and we're just setting that into, into instead of the GNU uh, ARM, we're setting it to just plain old Zephyr, and then we're setting the Zephyr SDK install directory to wherever you have it. Um, there are some sane, there are some defaults, like by default, Zephyr is going to be using the Zephyr toolchain. Uh, and uh, I, f I don't know off the top of my head where the default install directory is, but um, you have the options of putting it wherever you want. And then in this case, for me on Mac, uh, on Linux and on Windows, I'm placing uh, all the S you know the SDK tool chains within the .zephyr tools folder of the user home folder. Uh, and that's just for its sanity to keep everything together related to the tool chain or to the, um, the VS Code plugin. <clears throat> so if you've already initialized everything, all you have to do is update those environment variables and fingers crossed, it should work. And uh, for instance, I was using the GNU tool chain for um, an NCS 1.9 X project. And I was able to um, kind of run the NFED, some NFED samples and build them without any problems. Kind of mentioned that before. And then, uh, yeah, obviously it should be without saying, but it will not work unless you use if you update those environment variables, and you might have to do a a pristine build when you do it. That way, you clear out all the history of anything anything in the past. Make sure that you you're starting from scratch. I know in some cases I've had issues in the past where if I did if I changed something in the environment, um, it wouldn't take until I did a pristine build or I deleted the build folder. So just bear that in mind. 
<clears throat> so uh, the cool thing is the um, the 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 updates to the VS Code plugin actually does this for you by default. Um, it, it just downloads and sets up the ARM based toolchain, and uh, that's just uh, it's it's use, it's useful. And I'm hoping to actually make it so maybe you can or, you can organize the tool chains a little bit better, make it a little bit easier to um, integrate other types of projects, um, other types of targets. But uh, we'll see. Um, I'm also contemplating on opening source the or opening up the source for the plugin, uh, allowing the community to come in and, and tinker. Uh, I've actually had people request or you know have questions about it. It's like, hey, I don't see the source for this. Like, I don't know if we can use it for building our files. And rightfully so, if you have any concerns with security, obviously you want to make sure that things are transparent from the beginning to the end. So I understand that. So just trying to figure out the best way to do it and uh, to share it with the community. So we'll see. But if you'd like to see it open sourced, please leave a comment and um, we'll go from there. Dun, dun, dun. And now um, off to the next topic here, a uh, quick update is uh, this is the new latest version of the NRF9160 Feather. This is version, what is it? I don't even know what version I'm, I'm on right now. Let me grab this guy. We're in version five. So there are some big changes that came along with this guy. A lot of the same functionality, but some changes here. So uh, there's no longer that deep sleep mode. That's something I didn't put in here, but um, the sub micro ramp deep sleep mode, mostly because we the active sleep mode is actually much improved over the previous. I think um, when I measured it last time, it was 35 micro ramps. Um, now it's around four micro ramps, uh, and that's with the processor in active sleep. So you could have it in power save mode, you can have it connected to a network in power save mode and it'll be less than four microamps standalone. If you have other, if you have other uh, circuitry attached to your device, obviously you have to mitigate that uh, on your own, um, but uh, just standalone, that's, that's what uh, I would expect. It's always on, so kind of along the same lines. And uh, I removed one of the, the uh, diodes on the five volt line, so now uh, if you have a Let's say if you have a, um, a project that is has five volts and you want to feed it to the NRF9160, you actually can feed it into a five volt pin and it'll work. So this is cool. And uh, the finally the fan the most fancy feature is uh, getting um, getting into bootloader automatically. So previously you would have to hit the mode button, hit the reset button, and then let go, and then that would put it into the bootloader mode. Well, now uh, I've hooked up those pins using the CP2102, the USB to UART, and um, I'm doing that automatically using some USB code. So we'll jump into that in a second. And then um, long, long requested is an update for the VS Code plugin to include M1 Mac. So that is here. Uh, I think I, there, there's a caveat at the end, so I'll just, show, I'll just run through these little things. But I actually want to dive in and show um, some of the things that or some of these changes so you guys can see what happened. So I've updated the um, the chip to a TPS62840. This is a switching buck regulator and it's advertised to uh, use about 60 nanoamps uh, quiescent current. That's insane <laughs> for a switching regulator. Um, there are some other ones on the market that are uh, comparable from Maxim and other things, but I decided to go with the TI. Uh, when I measured it, it's a little bit more, and maybe that's because just the supporting circuitry around it. <clears throat> but uh, it works from 6.5 volts down to 1.8, and it's adjustable too. So it was a good fit. Uh, the only downside is that uh, anything from TI is hard to get right now. <laughs> Supply chains. Um, next, we'll just touch on the automatic bootloader because I thought it was kind of a cool thing to add. Uh, and I've included some links in the description below to both um, some notes from Lady Ada from Adafruit because uh, she was actually a little tutorial on writing USB commands directly to a CP2102 to control GPIOs. So it's kind of cool. And you can actually kind of see how I do it in Zephyr Tools. Uh, there is now, it was originally called Zephyr Tools Monitor and now it's just Zephyr Tools because it does other things as well. And uh, that's also included in the description below. But the only downside with this, um, the GPIO control, is you just gotta be cognizant of the fact that once you set 
a GPIO, you can't return it back to Hi-Z unless you've reset that chip. And there's no way to reset the chip uh, via USB. Like the, re the reset functionality, there's actually a reset command, but uh, in the data sheet it says it's not even used. It's not active, it, it won't do anything. So, useful. So bear that in mind if you find yourself doing something similar in your own designs. And uh, you can see I've hooked them up to what is it, GPIO 0 and 1. You got the reset pin and then the mode pin. And the mode pin controls uh, is what's being checked at the bootloader. If it's asserted during boot, it'll stay in bootloader mode. And uh, finally, the, um, the, uh, the Zephyr SDK, or the uh, tool, uh, the blah, blah, blah. The VS Code plugin now uses the Zephyr SDK ARM tool chain. That is for all platforms and also including Mac M1 support. The only, um, the only thing that's not working 100% yet, it's hard to test because I don't have an M1 Mac, but um, the Newt manager requires some cross-compiling dependencies. I actually tried to build it here uh, with the ARM64 target, but uh, it requires some libraries that are for M1 Mac. So we will uh, we'll get that going and then folks will be able to bootload. But in the meantime, they can also build their own if they're on an M1 Mac and have all the dependencies and libraries. Um, I think I have a link for that somewhere. I'll add that to the, I will add that to the description below. And that's it for today. Uh, please, if you are also interested in staying up to date, I also send out emails. Um, for, inst for instance, the NRF9160 was out of stock, or NRF9160 Feather was out of stock for a long time. Um, I sent an email out to the community about a couple weeks ago when I actually came back in stock. So uh, you are the first people to know when it is back in stock, and I'm hoping to keep things a little bit more stable moving forward. We do have some stock in some and some and some components that are tough to get so that is nice but uh check it out jaredwolf.com you can subscribe there to my mailing list and uh you'll be up to date and of course i send out emails before these live sessions and um just a fyi heads up this is what's happening so i'm not going to spam you i'm not going to do anything bad like that it's just for uh keeping connected with the community so and Let's see, I don't see any questions, but uh, it's great to be back. I've um, got a little new setup, actually got a new internet connection. So that also is hopefully helping because I only had uh, 10 megabytes per second upload before, which is terrible. And uh, fiber came into the area, so now 500 by 500, can't complain about that. And um, so well, the connection will hopefully, is hopefully a lot better than last time. So I did a little bit of testing before, but never shows up in testing. It only shows up in the live stream. So I don't know. Uh, thanks for being here. And uh, 